There's an old superstition dating back to medieval times that said it was good luck to wear a new piece of clothing on Easter as it symbolised freshness and rebirth. Both Shakespeare and Pepys make reference to this tradition. Over the years, it would be reshaped. By the Gilded Age, Easter Sunday became an opportunity for ladies and gentlemen to exhibit their finery on New York's Fifth Avenue. Evidence suggests that such displays may have dated from the city's earliest days. However, it was in the decade after the American Civil War, a time when many wanted to heal and look ahead to a brighter future, that New York's famous Easter Parade ascended. Not exactly a traditional parade. The Easter Parade is merely parishioners leaving St. Patrick's Cathedral or other churches and strolling down Fifth Avenue in their Sunday best. The event would attract more people over the years, with fashionistas and social climbers flocking to the event. Some believed that the tradition helped set the trend for the coming season. In recent years, the Easter Parade has become more about having fun and novelty, attracting about 30,000 people to Fifth Avenue annually. However, in the 1940s, the celebration would reach its zenith when an estimated 1 million participants strolled down the infamous street flaunting their decorative headwear. In no small part, this was due to the immense popularity of the 1948 MGM classic musical, Easter Parade. In the days after World War II, when the world once again wanted to heal and geopolitical tensions were developing into a long cold war, MGM, the studio that boasted more stars than in heaven, believed musical escapism was what the public most desired. Arthur Freed, head of MGM's most illustrious musical unit, wanted to recapture the magic of 1944's Meet Me in St. Louis. Not only wanting to find a vehicle for the studio's leading star, Judy Garland, but there was an appetite for nostalgic pieces. American audiences lapped up stories from a simpler time before world wars, when a youthful, vibrant energy seemed to be in the air. Meanwhile, at 20th Century Fox, Fame's composer Irving Berlin pitched an idea to his lifelong friend and head of production, Joseph Shank, to produce a movie musical around one of his classic hit songs, 1933's Easter Parade. Berlin was already a living legend and was renowned globally as a musical sensation for almost four decades. Not as celebrated today as he was, his artistic and commercial achievements today are arguably on par with Lennon and McCartney. Like the Beatles, Berlin could not read music and only played the piano in the key of F sharp. He utilised a unique lever under the piano keyboard that converted anything he played to F sharp. In 1947, Berlin should have been revelling in his recent successes, having scored God Bless America and to this day the biggest selling single of all time, White Christmas. He had also toured the globe with his morale boosting review, This is the Army. After returning to Broadway, he had another huge success with his first integrated musical, Annie Get Your Gun. Berlin, therefore, must have been surprised when 20th Century Fox refused to meet his asking price at the height of his powers. Berlin approached MGM under the pretext of borrowing one of their stars and the possibility of the composer working with the studio was floated. Berlin must have been a prestigious feather in MGM's cap and the studio gave him the price he wanted. However, the deal wasn't just a financial benefit to Berlin. Working alongside the hugely talented Judy Garland was also an enticement. Work began on the production with Garland's then husband and master of the Technicolor musical, Vincent Manelli, in the director's chair and Gene Kelly, dancing legend and Garland's co-star from Me and My Gal and The Pirate. Sid Charisse, Red Skelton, Catherine Grayson and Frank Sinatra were also touted to appear in the film. While screenwriters and married couple Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett were drafting the script, The Pirate's troubled production was wrapping up. After giving birth to daughter Liza, MGM not only wanted Judy back to work as quickly as possible, but also demanded that she lose weight. 
Since joining MGM at the age of 13, Garland battled with her weight. Her appearance was regularly criticised. The studio boss, Louis B. Mayer, referred to her as My Little Hunchback. She'd already been fed pet pills from a young age by her mother. And with the studio's encouragement, the young teenage performer was constantly provided barbiturates and amphetamines to help her lose weight and keep her energy up. Tragically, addiction took hold. Garland tried to kick the habit when first married to Minnelli. However, the demands of the studio and possibly postpartum depression meant that the 25-year-old Garland had reached breaking point during the production of The Pirate. A drug-induced hallucination, as well as an unpublished breakdown, resulted in hospitalisation. While recuperating, the young star blamed her husband for everything wrong with the picture and asked the studio, via her psychiatrist, to remove Manelli from the next project. MGM's most celebrated director was replaced with a relatively new to directing, Charles Walters, having just completed his first film, Good News. Walters had also previously um, appeared on screen with Garland in Presenting Lily Mars, and it was thought that he would be a friendly, positive presence for the vulnerable star. Fearing the initial script was too mean-spirited, Walters engaged recent Academy Award-winning screenwriter Sidney Sheldon to rewrite the script and lighten up the story. This was a minor inconvenience in comparison with what was to come. After rehearsals had begun, Gene Kelly fell and broke his ankle whilst playing his weekly volleyball game in his backyard. With the whole production in jeopardy, Kelly suggested Fred Astaire replace him. For Irving Berlin, Fred Astaire's inclusion would be an ideal scenario. Not only were the pair friends, but Astaire had previously worked on five of Irving Berlin's movie musicals. In 1976, Berlin would say of Astaire, He's not just a great dancer, he's a great singer of songs. He's as good as any of them, as good as Jolson or Crosby or Sinatra. He's just as good a singer as he is a dancer, not necessarily because of his voice, but by his conception of projecting a song. The only problem was Astaire had retired two years previously to focus on his investments in horse racing. Discussing the situation with Gene Kelly and his excitement about working with Judy Garland persuaded Fred to join the cast. Only four days after Kelly's injury, Astaire reported for duty at the MGM lot and thus began the second stage of Fred Astaire's career in front of the camera. Sid Charisse would also tear a ligament, ruling her out of the film, and the call went out for a new dancer to replace her. Anne Miller had made her screen debut at RKO age 14. She had previously been in a relationship with MGM boss Louis B. Mayer. She had since married an abusive alcoholic who had thrown the heavily pregnant Miller down the stairs, which tragically resulted in the baby's death. When she auditioned and won the role of Nadine, the dancer was still fitted with a back brace. Anne Miller is wonderful in the role, subtly comedic as an artistic, conniving Nadine. But it's her bravura dance performance in Shaking the Blues Away that stands out and turned Miller into a star and won her an MGM contract. By this time, Sinatra, Skelton and Grayson's roles were scrapped. Having scored a recent success with the college musical Good News, Peter Lawford was cast to play wealthy college boy Johnny Harrow. Lawford had been on the MGM payroll since 1942, and while he would go on to have some success, he is today best remembered as the one-time brother-in-law of John F. Kennedy, and a member of the Rat Pack. In Easter Parade, he is amiable as Astaire's much, much younger best friend. And while not a strong singer, his scenes with Judy are genuinely sweet. Lawford's Johnny has an unrequited love for Judy's Hannah, and he deals with her rejection with a refreshing class and kindness. Easter Parade would also mark the film debut of Jules Munchen in the small yet notable role as the waiter. Generally, his performance is fine, but his comedy salad scene just seems dated and awkward today. 
And this is probably because it served as a public screen test for the actor, who would go on to star in MGM's On the Town and Silk Stockings. Despite the problems in pre-production, Easter Parade shoot went surprisingly well. Garland had to reshoot some scenes for the pirates, but this proved to be no issue. Before the shoot, the two stars had never met, but got on well and Fred stabilised Judy's nerves. Garland also found an ally in Irving Berlin and was clearly the frontrunner for when MGM would produce Annie Get Your Gun, which they had just bought the rights for. There's not much of a plot to Easter Parade. Don Hughes, a stair, loses his scheming dance partner and romantic interest, Nadine Ann Miller. Boasting he can make a star out of anyone, he randomly plucks Hannah Brown Garland from a chorus line and trains her. He quickly realises she has her own distinctive talent and the pair become a hit. Meanwhile, his best friend Johnny falls in love with Hannah, but she loves Don, who loves Nadine, who loves Johnny. While the film used a few songs from Berlin's back catalogue, the composer also wrote new pieces, including Stepping Out With My Baby and A Couple of Swells. Judy also performed a song called Mr. Monotony, which ended up on the cutting room floor. It's an interesting song about a trombone player's rivalry with a clarinet, continuously repeating the same notes. It's an outstanding performance from Judy, but it just didn't fit in with the film. Check it out on YouTube if you can. Stepping Out With My Baby is the Astaire showpiece, employing state-of-the-art effects with Astaire in the foreground in slow motion, with the chorus line behind at standard speed. Astaire frantically alternates between dance partners, alternating dances from ballet to blues and the jitterbug. I probably should point out there is a debate that this number is using blackface. While it's clearly not a minstrel performance, everybody certainly appears to be tanned, but I can find no official confirmation if this is the case or not. The song and performance would quickly become a hit and is today a classic jazz standard. A Couple of Swells is the classic comical number that allowed Judy to clown something she adored doing with Kelly, but was new to the usually dapper Astaire. The scene is a classic and a delight to watch. The stars are clearly having fun, enjoy working together, and there is a magical synchronicity to the performance. Earlier in the film, Hannah, billed as Juanita, makes her dance debut and is hilariously bad and is dressed in a ridiculous, ostentatious dress with feathers flying around. It is reminiscent of the Ginger Rogers dress from the Cheek to Cheek dance sequence in Berlin and Astaire's earliest collaboration from Top Hat. I can't help thinking that this was a deliberate choice and I don't know if this is a statement Hannah is not like Nadine, like Judy isn't Ginger, but a talent in her own right. Or if it's merely a cheeky nod to a dress that Astaire hated because he feared the feathers would be a distraction and would mess up his carefully choreographed dance sequence. The musical numbers and comedy scenes with Astaire and Garland really work. Unfortunately, the romance feels obligatory and tacked on. Astaire was twice Garland's age and the relationship seems more paternal than romantic. Obviously, this is a regular occurrence throughout Hollywood's history and it's not always a problem. However, as Astaire seems to be the most chaste of leading men, it looks laboured and I could do without it. The film is set between Easter's 1911 and 1912 and what better way to trigger nostalgia than to showcase various songs from that period. The year the Easter Parade is set is also the same one where Irving Berlin scored his first massive hits and became an international celebrity with Alexander's Ragtime Band. The songs in the vaudeville sequence, I Love a Piano, Snooky Ookums, Ragtime Violin and When the Midnight Choo Choo Leaves for Alabama are all from this era of Berlin's work and incorporate the syncopated ragtime style. This work contributed to Berlin's reputation as the king of ragtime. 
This title understandably angered many African Americans, especially Scott Joplin. There has been justifiable accusations of Berlin appropriating ragtime from African American musicians. Of course, many talented black musicians were also not given the same opportunities or publicity as their white counterparts. Berlin himself argued he was celebrating the music. As is the case of everything else American, their universally popular music is the product of a sort of musical melting pot. Therefore, those who label our popular dances and song music as typical American music hit the bullseye in so naming it. For it is the syncopation of several lands and centuries, Americanized. The original song, Easter Parade, was sung by Clifton Webb and comes from Berlin's groundbreaking 1933 review, As Thousands Cheer, starring Ethel Waters. Interestingly, the most commercially successful Christmas and Easter songs were written by Irving Berlin, who was Jewish. Philip Roth probably put it best when he wrote, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and then he gave Irving Berlin Easter Parade and White Christmas, the two holidays that celebrate the divinity of Christ, the divinity that's the heart of the Jewish rejection of Christianity. And what does Irving Berlin brilliantly do? He turns their religion into schlock. They love it. Everybody loves it. If schlockified Christianity is Christianity cleansed of Jew hatred, then three cheers for schlock. While I think it's a disservice to refer to Berlin's obvious talent as schlock, I agree with Roth that Berlin's songs were universally popular and provided these holidays with a carefree secular joy. I think this is reflected in the movie, which MGM marketed as the happiest musical ever made. I don't know if I agree with that, but Easter Parade is certainly an uncynical, joyful romp. The film ends with the title song where Garland sings the traditionally male vocal. She takes charge and woos Astaire in a surprisingly progressive, sincere manner. The final shot is of our leads strolling amongst the revellers in Easter Parade down MGM's fake Fifth Avenue, complete with 700 extras and over 100 period vehicles and using a technical process called the Newcomb Shot, it impressively recreated 1912 New York and audiences were impressed. Easter Parade would be MGM's biggest hit for 1948 and the highest grossing musical. Despite a troubled start, it was a happy event for everybody and even came in under budget by $191,000. The studio hoped this success could be repeated with Garland and Astaire in the Barclays of Broadway, then later with Royal Wedding. Garland was also meant to play the lead role in Berlin's Annie Get Your Gun, recording the soundtrack and even shooting a few scenes. Sadly, it wasn't to be. Though Judy would continue to make hit films at MGM, Easter Parade would be her last lead in a big budget musical. It really was the beginning of the end and two years after Easter Parade, the studio suspended Judy Garland. Easter Parade was a happy experience for everybody involved, including Garland. This is reflected on screen. The plot is thin with its shallow glorification of show business, Yet everyone is giving 100% and the musical numbers are generally catchy and perfectly staged. Though not the best from the studio or the stars, Easter Parade is one of the great MGM musicals for a good reason. I believe it remains and will continue to endure as a classic from the golden age of musicals.